Uh, welcome back to another Whiskey Wednesday with Benny's Beverage Depot. I'm Pat from the Whiskey Hotline with Joe and Brett, of course. Our special guests this week, uh, too, we have Dr. Don Livermore and Gina Fawcett. Dr. Don is a master blender at, uh, what, are we, what, is, what is the official name of the distillery now, Don? It's, a higher, it's, it's a higher Walker distillery uh, in Windsor, Ontario. Okay, very yeah. large distillery, one of the largest distilleries on the continent, actually. And uh, Gina has been in the whiskey business for quite a while and acts as our local guide for a lot of the Canadian whiskey blended mysteries that we do. Uh, so we've got a couple things to talk about today. Really want to talk about the J.P. Weiser's uh, whiskeys. They have a really excellent aged range. We have the 23 year in front of me here. Uh, and then we've got a cool blending project that we just did with Dr. Don just a few weeks ago, actually. We did a, a custom blend, a couple of custom blends over Zoom. We had uh, quite an experience. Uh, but anyway, uh, Don, you want to talk about J.P. Weiser's maybe first? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to throw a a PowerPoint up uh, for you guys here, uh, share it on here. And we're going to talk about uh, uh, so why Weiser's whiskey is the way they are. So um, can you guys see that on the screen there? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. And so chip in if with natural questions, because I know you guys are a curious bunch and I know we're, we've uh, been friends for many years, uh, uh, but uh, let's, let's take it away. And I wanted, I wanted to, go today a little bit too and address my thoughts when I come into blending whiskey and especially when it comes to aged whiskeys as into the JP Weiser's lineups and why Canadian whiskey is a little bit different than than the American styles of whiskeys. So myself, I've been in the industry. This is my 25 year anniversary. It's my silver anniversary this year. Congratulations. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I started as a microbiologist and then uh I've had an opportunity to work in the distilling and uh, in the blending side of our businesses. And uh, I've completed my master's and PhD in brewing and distilling at Harriet Watt uh, University uh, through the years. So uh, I put it to good use to every day. The other thing that your group and audience here, and you can see uh, on it, and maybe Pat, you can copy in that link uh, for this recorded session uh, mm -hmm. for the groups is the whiskey wheel. This is something I've created for the LCBO back in 2016, where this is a little bit of a different flavor wheel than what uh, traditionally has been used in our industry. I got asked to make a Canadian whiskey flavor wheel, and I half asked joked to say, do people really use those things? And uh, the LCBO, which is our, our Liquor Control Board of Ontario, said, yeah, yeah, we'd really like to see a Canadian version of it. So I put pen to paper, and it took me uh, about 24 hours to make this. It took marketing about uh, nine months to make it nice and beautiful looking at this. But this is the thought of a blender, really, Pat. Um, and it's going to come clear as I, I go along in my uh, presentation here that flavor for whiskey really only comes from three places. It either comes from the grain, uh, yeast, fermentation, or wood. Uh, the barrel. And uh, I know the audience is already automatically thinking water. And my thoughts behind not adding water on this flavor wheel is if water is creating such an impact that it creates a, a major flavor there, we got whole other issues and problems going on. And especially when you're distilling the product. So um, the second ring of the wheel are the things I can manipulate. I can change the grains around from wheat to barley, to rye, to corn, to malt. Unfortunately, grain can spoil, and there are some whiskeys out there that can have that uh, nuance to it. Um, yep. Let's hope it doesn't happen to that in our distillery, but it is included on the flavor wheel here. Uh, yeast, we can change the conditions around where we can influence to make green grass or herbal notes, fruity, floral, soapy, sulfur. There can be a sour note in whiskeys, like that dill pickle note. Traditionally, that's your sour mash uh, or, that, or bacterial infections inside of your fermenter. Um, that's how dill will get in, into the flavor of whiskeys. And the wood part, I can burn casks a certain way. I'm going to talk about that. Finish, uh, I think your audience will be well aware of that. And mm -hmm. aging whiskey certainly will give you a character. We're going to focus in on all that. The third ring of the wheel is what you care about and what your consumers will care about. Those are the descriptors. Uh, you know, uh, that is your apricots, pear, apple, um, spicy, smoky, etc. And the really cool thing about this whiskey wheel uh, is the molecular compound that causes that flavor is the fourth ring of the wheel. So if you get a banana note in your whiskey, uh, that's isolamyl acetate, that's a fruity character, and yeast was the thing that made it. And that's, that's the really vision. cool. Yeah, and that connects the dots as to what I'm, uh, what I think about when making whiskey. Um, 
it's going to come clear to I'm going to as we go along to your why that's where uh, whiskey wheel is fairly clever. But to take you back when when we are making Canadian whiskey, and I know you guys approached me about making and doing a cast selection with me, and I, I you, you knew I hesitated a little bit because for Canadian whiskey we're blended, mm-hmm. we're, we're we're pretty much the opposite of bourbon, right? We we separate the grains. We we ferment corn separately, rye separately, barley separately, wheat separately. We distill it separately. We age it separately, and we put it together at the end. That's why they have a job like mine as a master blender. If you, if you ever notice the audience in the audience, you will t- uh, talk to Scotch producers as master blenders, but you'll talk to bourbon producers as master distillers because they make that mash bill. That's really how they can innovate is really at the start, whereas I, I can innovate at the end if I choose to separate the grains. Now, Canadian whiskey doesn't have to do it that way, but the larger producers tend to because of innovation. I don't know what you guys want five years from now, Pat. Mm -hmm. I I really don't. Um, 10 years from now, who knows? If I would have known rye was as popular as it was, we would have made more rye 10 years ago, Um, (laughs) right? And and you're chuckling. And and, uh, I know there's some wheat things that are kind of, we're starting to see some uh, noise on that as well. And it's one of the things I've been working on uh, as well, a little bit. Um, we, I, I want to highlight two things. Our region being, uh, we're close to Detroit, we're around the Windsor area. Um, we are corn region. So most of the grain we will get is, is close to our distillery. I know that's a nice thing to say. We get all local grain. But in reality, when it comes to a distillery, I'll be honest, it comes to costs, right? And shipping is probably your big cost when it comes to grain. So you want to use those grains more uh, uh, that are local to you. And corn is probably the largest one we use. And most of the grain we will get is 97% of it comes within probably 60 miles of our distillery. And then it does Canadian grain. There's about two years ago, we did get U.S. grain when we had a real rainy season. But but for the most part, it's Canadian grain. The other thing I want to point out, and I know you've seen this, guys, when you've went to our distillery, the most important test uh, at the grain elevator is actually physically picking up and smelling the grain. Our person there, we call the gatekeeper, will reject the gain, a grain based on its smell. And she's looking for a musty character. That's that geosma note I talked about earlier on that whiskey mm-hmm. bill. And the only way as distillers can detect it is just physically smelling it. I'm trying to work on a way to see if we can actually detect it analytically. Uh, but at the moment, the best way is to reject it that way our person actually works there's no way to chemically test for that just kind of musty character there is but it takes about an hour to test and when you're Uh, dealing with 15 truckloads of grain a day you can't have it waiting in the yard yeah that's a lot of grain and 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 it's good to have the technology but if it's as simple as smelling it then why not smell it yeah absolutely and our producers know it and it's their livelihood. A, a truck of grain could cost anywhere from about $5,000 to about $35,000 if it's malt. And wow. it's their livelihood. If, they, if it gets rejected, that, that's a big deal to them. But we, we know it. We do it. I've seen her stop trucks. Um, I, I saw the one year we, she rejected her rate about 40%. That was that real wow. rainy season I talked about. Um, it happens in Where whiskey. Where does that, when, when that happens, when that mold too, just from a... a, a material handing perspective when you get that mold or that mustiness does that happen coming out of the field does that happen in the silo where is that occurring it, it, it's both areas i think that was a very very astute question actually uh it can be both we can cause it ourselves um or we can uh or or we can uh purchase it for, I, I know there were some rye producers that were just storing it on the floor not even in grain elevators and it got to wow. be a problem for us I have a question too, Dr. Don. Uh, how many gatekeepers do you have? Sorry, that. Yeah, you're Sorry. putting your headphones on there. I was wondering how many gatekeepers you have because uh, I, I would think that it would be a, uh, you'd want a couple in case somebody's. Yeah, yeah. oh, yeah. yeah. Cold yeah. One day, you could, a whole truckload of bad stuff could come in. Yeah, they're very, very, very well trained um, uh, on determining ter- determining it. Just so it's not kept to one person either. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if it does slip through, then I got to deal with it as a master blender. And we're talking about age statements a little bit today. Eighteen years later, <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> if that happens, yeah. right? It'd be a shame to age at eighteen years and have to redistill it, and make vodka from it. That's what would ultimately happen. 
so you don't so there's because i know that it happens I've, a, a tremendous amount in the scotch world not so much in bourbon there is there any sort of back of the house exchange with other distillers for entry-level blends that might occur um it's blending it out would be your easiest way to deal with it so that's what probably okay. would happen if you had that's that's what you try to do like i said uh, you could the worst case is you end up making vodka you distill it. it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, when I'm thinking grain too, corn is sweet. I think this audience probably knows that barley is, is, is classic. Barley is classic single malts or our Irish whiskey, right? You got that nutty character rise tends to be the Canadian whiskey. I know there's American straight rise and stuff as well. That's that clove, ginger, spicy cinnamon notes mm -hmm. and wheat. I sometimes will call it the Tim Hortons character, the bready. <laughs> I don't know if this audience knows what Tim Hortons is, but Canadian <laughs> certainly does. Uh, it's like the Starbucks uh, of Canada. Uh, that gives you a nice pastry notes uh, into your whiskey. I funny too, uh, I know when we did our blending little exercise, we'll talk about this probably towards the end here. I, I find our, our because we use red winter wheat, and I find it gives an interesting uh, licorice note uh, on the taste and a nice note. Uh, interesting. It's, yeah, it's very interesting as well. So uh, something to pay attention to if you get a licorice note. Because we kind of had that discussion a little bit with Moonshine University, who we've done some stuff with before about what does wheat actually do? Yeah. And in the bourbon world, at least, is wheat's job to actually create a lot of flavors or wheat's job to stay the hell out of the way of the corn and sort of let corn shine through and just provide some feel and texture in the mouth? Brett, you're talking my language, the bl uh, yeah. blending, and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it is a challenge to work with wheat it's not it's not uh it's it, it, it's it, it's a polarizing grain i find uh people love it or hate it i find uh, the, well and it's great irony that it also seems to be the whiskeys made with that grain are the ones that cause people to perform at their worst behavior in terms <laughs> of the way at least in the bourbon world um but anyway um I, I, I'm going to just quickly too, just, just so you know, because it's going to be important with rye here. And, and I want to stress this thing. We do cook, and I know a lot of people, when, when we talk about whiskey, they don't want to talk about cooking, but it is important. And, and I'll show you on the next slide here as to why. We really want starch. That's what we really want when we're cooking. And starch is 10,000 molecules of sugar put together. Um, and yeast can't eat starch. Yeast can eat sugar. It's, sometimes I say it's like a T-bone steak, right? You can't put a whole T-bone steak in your mouth at one time and eat it. You have to cut it up. So we asked to- I, You've never been to dinner with Brett. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you're, you're a new hybrid of yeast cell, Brett. <laughs> you have to cut it up. And, and, and there's two ways of doing it. The traditional way is malt. Um, and that's what we like to talk about, I, but I'll be upfront with you. Canadian whiskey producers, we buy commercial enzymes. Mm -hmm. We have probably for 60 years. Uh, it's, it's not a new technology anymore. Uh, although it's probably getting out more and more as, as distillers are now talking about it, but uh, enzymes are what we tend to use. Um, I would uh, say the vast majority of American distillers use them as well. Yeah, I would think so. Whether they talk about them or not, Pat, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I'll be upfront. Like I said, we've been using them for a long, long time. Um, and that's, that's the knife to the T-bone steak, right? That's what enzymes are doing is cutting up the, the mm -hmm. starch into the individual sugars. That's the best analogy I could give. We, uh, you have to, when you're make, cooking it too, you have to use cold water when you're putting all the ingredients together because the starch will snowball on itself. It becomes too tacky and sticky. Um, that's, that's, if you've got any distillers who are listening to, you got to keep it below 67 degrees Celsius when you're mixing this stuff together. We do add sour mash because we want to drive the pH low. And what sour mash is to us as Canadians, it's the leftovers after distillation. So it's, it's, it's very low in pH. This is what it's doing. And it's driving acidity down. You're using, using, you're using that uh, attribute about it. And it's really for the fifth ingredient that nobody really wants to talk about in the brewing business or the wine making business, nitrogen. Yeast will only grow as fast as how much nitrogen you give it. In fact, yeast is probably 52% protein, so it needs that for growth. Um, the, and we, we want it lower because nitrogen will bring your pH up. How do you introduce nitrogen to the process? It, it's a liquid form. We okay. use liquid, liquid form nitrogen right into the process. Uh, brewers will use um, proteases. Uh, Winemakers will use a, a, an ammonium salt. It's called diammonium phosphate. 
um, that's what they'll use to help their process along. But we, we, because we have sour mash with us, we can get a use that liquid nitrogen form. Hmm. See, learn something today. And in, and I like the slide too along the right hand side. That starch under a microscope as it explodes open. You got to pop it open like popcorn. Uh, you can see the temperature rising there, and that's at that point the enzymes can start working. Mm -hmm. So that's the primary reason for cooking. But I, there's a secondary reason for it. It's the other flavors you want to get out of your whiskey. And one of the things I want to show is the grain rye. And I really want to focus on the shell of it, the husk. And I know if probably people can relate. They picked up grain before, and the husk is, is very, very solid. And, and it's made up of three molecules. It's made of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. And you can see them on the right. They're big, big molecules. But the best way I describe it is cellulose and hemicellulose are, are bricks, lignin is the cement. And it kind of ties itself together to make it a hard structure. If you see that chart there, the point I want to bring across is by far, rye has the most lignin in comparison to all the other grains, by far. It has a lot of cement, okay? Why that is important, here's lignin. And I know you guys have been to our distillery. What was the temperature like when you walked into the brew house? Boy, it was pretty hot. Yeah, it was smoking hot because we're cooking, right? We're heating, we're distilling. What happens, it busts apart lignin into these smaller little molecules, right? This is where your, why rye is spicy. Don't ask me how much rye is in my whiskey. Ask me how much for ethyl That is the real question you want to ask. That's why bourbon producers, myself as a Canadian whiskey blender, we will use rye in our mash bills or in our blends to drive that spicy flavor up. And it has to do with the cooking process. And it has to do with the nature of rye. One of the things I've been working on in the last number of years, I, I use a unique strain of rye called Brissetto rye because um, it has a high level of 4 ethyl in it. Hmm. Okay. Is that, is that a harder strain to grow or does it have a lower it's yield? I mean, it's, do you have to work with farmers just to get it? Yeah, we have to work with farmers to contract plant it. It's, it was developed in Germany. That's where a lot of the uh, rye hybrid mm -hmm. breeding programs are. And uh, it actually gives better yield <laughs> to be honest with you, it's more consistent. Wow. Uh, and it's, and as long as you know the enzyme cocktail to put in for rye, uh, that's the other question I get with people, rye is hard to work with. No, it's not if you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. But this is the side effect. I want to point out something to you guys, because I know you guys are a real knowledgeable group. You've got, you've gone to single malt producers, right? You've, mm -hmm. you've been to Scotland, right? They have a lot of ton, right? So what yep. lauder tons do is it removes the husks of the barley malt prior to fermentation. Are they losing an opportunity for flavor? Because it's mm. not going through the distilling process. Yeah, yep. versus distilling on the grain versus yeah. just a distiller's beer. Yeah, uh, you, the chart you're currently th showing us says yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Although I, this is primarily focused on rye. I mean, this yeah. particular breakdown is rye rather but than barley. Barley has fiber too, though. Yeah. <laughs> barley sure. has fiber as well. So what would be, how much does the difference, what is the difference in, in, in amount and intensity of what yeah. would come Brett. through this in barley versus rye? <laughs> Damn, I knew you were going to ask that question. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the answer to it. I, I would anticipate it's a lot like DNA. So you, you would just get a different proportion of gaiacol, cresol, porethyl gaiacol, porethyl phenol, eugenol. Mm -hmm. It would just be different proportions. I don't, I, that, that's a PhD for somebody right there. If anybody's doing a PhD and listening, uh, there's there's a good, good case study for oh, somebody. It's yeah. me. It's me. Currently, <laughs> currently doing a PhD. Oh, is he? Okay. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> the other thing I want to point out to you, because I know there's Scotch producers le uh, listening to this as well. Um, peat. If you really think what peat is, it's plant material. Mm -hmm. It's been in the ground for a thousand years, which turns into a coal. So it's basically degraded plant material, degraded lignin. This is why why these molecules, these are the same molecules that, that come out of peat when you smoke uh, and dry down malt. I, I, Gina gave me a t-shirt that, that says, lignin's the world's most unappreciated molecule. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it is impacts whiskey so much, but we really don't, and par probably impacts food so much. Every time you cook food, it, every plant material will have fiber to it, 
this is a, where a lot of your flavors will come from. Hmm. Very interesting, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just quickly going on because I want to get to the first whiskey here. My, I'm getting a little parched. Um, here's our fermentation. I just want to just show this as well. Um, the, uh, we ferment corn separately and rye separately. You can see that. And the other thing I want to say is yeast produces ethanol and carbon dioxide. It also produces that fruity, floral, green grass, soapy sulfur note uh, I, I alluded to earlier on that whiskey wheel. We are brewers first, guys. This is what beer people do very well. This is what wine people mm -hmm. actually do very well with their unique strains of yeast. Unfortunately, with whiskey producers, I don't think they are whiskey consumers. I don't think they know yeast even makes our product. Yet, it probably impacts the flavor more than anything else. Hmm. Um, we get up to 15. Our record's probably 17% alcohol in our corn mash. If really, any, any brewer wants to. Time. What's that? That is crazy high. I've never heard. I've never heard of a distillery getting that high, you know, just a wash ferment before like that. I mean, you you travel anywhere on the Bourbon Trail and it's eight to ten percent alcohol in Scotland. It's eight twelve percent maybe something like that. Twelve percent is, where, is huge. where yeast tends to peter out. Pat, mm -hmm. you want to really know how to get here? If we're getting down to rabbit holes here, if you want to know how to get to 15, 16 percent, it's how you feed the nitrogen to yeast. Uh, we, we actually give it a big chunk of it at the start in the cooking process. As the fermentation continues, we will actually add in, in dose rates of, of uh, nitrogen, and that pushes it up to 15, 16%. There, wow. I give you our, our little secret on, on, on how that's done. Well, watch out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open a distillery of the same size and make the, and replicate the whiskey now. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and, and so, and you, and because you so precisely described how much, good luck trying to figure that out, right? <laughs> you know to do it. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll tell you, the way to do it, though, think about a birthday cake. If it was your birthday this week, let's say you had it on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. If you ate the entire cake on the Sunday, you get a big belly ache. But you'd feel much better if you ate a slice the entire week on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That's the same thing with yeast. If you spoon feed it, it treats you well. Yeah, otherwise it just drowns. You just bury yeah. it. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely the best analogy I've, I've, I can give is something like that. Hmm. Yeah, it's crazy high. It's crazy high, uh, but it, it's, I mean, uh, we've worked very hard to, to, to get to that high and those efficiency levels. Yeah. How much analysis are you in the fermentation? Because if you, people can see, that's just a tiny, tiny portion of what's available. How much analysis as you're fermenting over that three-day period do you do of each fermentation or each fermenter? So we have 39 of them. Fermentation? Yeah. We have 39. So we're going down real rabbit holes here. So I <laughs> developed a technology called NIR, which is near infrared reflectance back in 1998. Uh, I can measure one fermenter, the sugar, acid, and alcohol level uh, uh, in about 20 seconds. Okay. When I first started in the 90s, it took me four hours to do one fermenter. Uh, now I, I've developed the technology for the, I've actually spoken around the world on this topic. Um, I was the guy who invented the technique um, and we monitor our fermentations like a Six Sigma black belt, like they would in an automotive industry. Mm -hmm. Fermentation is the heartbeat of a distillery. If it doesn't go right, it causes distillation problems, dry grain problems. It causes flavor problems. Distillation is the, mo or sorry, the fermentation is the heartbeat of what we do. Yeah. Does it make sense? I, I yeah. know, hopefully it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Brett, we were really going down. I know you guys asked those right. good questions. <laughs> uh, these, these are the things we can, yeast, if you can le read at your leisure. Um, mm -hmm. Time, oxygen levels, uh, uh, nitrogen levels, mixing can affect yeast, making more or less of these. For, brewers do this all day long, all day long. This is how they make beer. They make beer very well. Um, we as distillers are getting better at it, um, but uh, but something we are starting to pay more and more attention to. Okay, distilling. <clears throat> okay, so this is a column still. I know you've probably had bourbon producers on this. Our mm -hmm. our still is copper. Uh, Thirty has thirty four trays inside of it, and it's got ninety six holes in the tray. The simplest thing when I describe distillation is this: is you take the whole grain mash, you put it the fourth tray from the top and just spill it on the, and it will fall through the holes to the bottom. At the bottom, you add steam. 
alcohol's boiling point is 78 degrees Celsius, water's 100. So all the alcohol vapor is going to rise to the top, go through this condenser, and we make white dog. We call it high wines in Canada. Same, same mm -hmm. thing, 70% alcohol. That, that's a column still. But the really thing you really need to remember is one pass through a column still, you keep the, the grain flavor you're using, the yeast flavors, the fruity, floral, green grass, soapy flavors. The copper salts out the sulfur notes the yeast has made. And you can see in the picture in the left hand there, there's copper sulfate salting mm -hmm. out on the tray. It's that green, white residue. Sometimes you see on, on copper when it's outdoors. That's <laughs> from acid rain. That's the same reaction, right? That's copper sulfate salting out on a copper roof, right? Same mm -hmm. thing that's happening in the still. So we have manholes in our stills here that we have to open up about every three or four months and power wash that stuff out. I, I'm just going to give a secret. We all use copper stills we have for 10 centuries. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just to, for the point of pulling out uh, sulfur. And those who are using stainless steel stills, it's probably even more important where you put the copper. The copper needs to be near the top. Uh, I know in this still particular, we actually had, um, they look like brill pads. Uh, we add some sacrificial copper as well to help salt out the, the sulfur notes in our whiskey. Yeah. So it's just packed with copper. It, it's not a yeah. deflagmator up top. It's just packed with copper then? Did we just, yeah, we just pack it with copper. Uh, that's kind of how we've uh, gone through it through the years. Yep. Yep. Yeah. If, I should get put a picture in the slide, but it just looks like a, a brill pad. If you know what a brill pad is, mm -hmm. just copper shavings yeah. really. Yeah. 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 That's how bourbon's made. So we, we make yep. the style and we age it. And the other thing with Canadian whiskey, we can double this still it. So I can, this is a insulated still. It is made of copper. Um, and if you pass it twice through a co uh, column still, it makes light whiskey. That's key to Weiser's Deluxe. Okay, this is key to most Canadian whiskeys is that light, smooth, we call it DD. I can make it from corn, wheat, rye, or barley, and you can't tell the difference. Hmm. Okay, sometimes when I know you went through the blending with me guys a couple of times, when we blend whiskey, this is like the double distilled uh, is like pizza dough. That's the majority of your pizza. Uh, the rye, the barley, and the wheat are single distilled, and that gives you the flavor to what you're doing. Right. Hmm. So we, we control the careful part about this is you got to be very careful when you say, ask about a Canadian whiskey is a, you got to ask what grain did you use? B you gotta ask, ask, how was it distilled? There's a brand in Canada that says on their label, hundred percent rye whiskey and you taste it. And I go, damn, I don't taste any four ethyl guy call, but I know they've double distilled it. I think you're the only guy that. around who thinks of uh, tasting notes like that instead of like, hmm, it's not, it's kind of lacking in caramel or toast. There's, well, that, it's missing, it's really missing the four ethyl guayacol. Guayacol, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I say it quickly, but yeah. Yeah, but it, distilling shapes your whiskey. It, 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 that's a pun in a sense, but yeah, it, it really shapes your whiskey, right? Mm -hmm. So when we talk Weiser's 15 year, okay, so it's, it's largely double distilled light whiskey. Okay, aged 15 years. And then what I do with this one as well is I add a couple of components to it. So I'll add uh, 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 a little bit of rye whiskey to it. So that's single column distilled rye. Okay, so mm -hmm. it is a blend. And the other thing I add actually, and I'll be honest with you too, in Canadian whiskey, we have a, an unusual rule as well. There, it's unusual, but it's not because it is traditional to Canadian whiskey. Is 9.09% .09 of our blends, we can add wine or two-year-old other spirits. Okay. So those tend to be more expensive ingredients to us, but it's another way we can bring in flavors to Canadian whiskey. There's a history mm -hmm. to it for us doing that. So this one, I add a little bit of wine actually to it. Hmm. And uh, we used to call the term Paxaret Sherry, if that's any, any, if you've been in the industry for a while, that may have some familiarity to you. Uh, today, legally, you have to call it a para wine, but it's a it's sweet done. type of sherry wine. That, that we but it is, is it wine. as concentrated as typical Paxaret that would have been used at oh, yeah. one time in the, oh, so it's yeah. as concentrated as Paxaret. Yeah, because we have this for generations. We've been using We have this somewhere for floating around, we do have Paxaret somewhere floating around in the office, yeah. a sample of it. Really? Yeah. 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 And, and it doesn't take much, but it gives you that dried fruit note to it too. So I want to balance a little bit of that dried fruit note to it. So I do add, I mean, it's less than a half a percent actually, but it's just enough to give you that dried fruit uh, note uh, in, into this whiskey. And that's what we're trying to do with it. Okay. Hmm. So if you got it, I got, I'm going to taste it. If you guys have it in front of you, I'm going to taste it. But uh, if you don't, <laughs> I suggest you to get a bottle and taste it. 
Um, the other thing is what the re important things I've done with that flavor wheel and why I brought it up at the very beginning of this presentation is I can overlay that pol uh, flavor wheel and make a polar histogram. Okay. That's cool. And what I can do is basically tell you where, what the majority of the flavor is on, in this whiskey. So in this case, it is the age. And we're going to have a, a predominantly green apple note into it because that's what aging will do. And I'm going to talk about that in oh, a few yeah. minutes. You could see there's a little bit of rye. Here's that, that's the brown axis going this way. And largely it's made a double distilled light corn whiskey. And because it's aged 15 years, I'm going to get uh, a little bit of, uh, of that, uh, of the burnt, certainly the wood caramel talking mm -hmm. notes and then oh sorry i gotta go back to slide um and if you're really clever enough i just basically gave you the recipe to wiser's 15 year yeah <laughs> and, and around the outside what i have is the type of distillation we used in it so the first ring in percentage is the dd double distilled whiskey the second one is column and pot still there's zero percent in that and you can see the percentage of column distilled rye i actually put into this blend okay oh yeah and the, and the right hand axis shows you the percentage of each of the barrel types I use. So I use a bourbon barrels into it, which give you dried fruit notes, used Canadian whiskey barrels, which will help emphasize the rye um, when they're a used barrel or the smaller grains. And then I have a little bit of new American uh, oak as well, which helps boost the vanilla, vanilla notes a little bit. Yeah. Cheers, by the way. Cheers, A. Cheers. Cheers, A. Yeah. <laughs> this is a hell of a whiskey and a hell of a value. Brett, uh, Brett's in front of his computer. What are we selling this for right now, Brett? Uh, we are... I know what it is. Forty nine ninety nine. So, yeah, it's for, fifty bucks for fifty for fifteen year old whiskey. Yeah, yeah. you're not going to find that anywhere else. That's for sure. This is kind of my go to uh, at home, actually. To be honest with you. Yeah, it's approachable. It doesn't taste watered down, considering the forty percent alcohol either. It's still round, and it's a nice whiskey. And that's the Wiser's classic Wiser's taste. We want that traditional lighter smooth, easy drinking, approachable style of whiskey. That's what we're trying to do with this one. Cool. I know you've guys out of the things you've done with me, but when the Wiser's family, that's what we tried to, to work with. Now is, uh, are, so are the other aged Wiser's kind of built along these same guidelines of bit yep. of rye? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the 18 years not, uh, but I'm going to talk about that in a minute, okay. but, uh, uh, but the other ones we've made, yeah. Yeah, the Wiser's Deluxe. I'm not sure if you have the Wiser's Deluxe is in your store. has a little bit of rye. It's kind of the same profile as this one, but not as much age, obviously. And what um, about the triple barrel rye Wiser's? Is that similar in profile? Uh, that's what the triple barrel rye, which I do not have in the slide, but it, it's definitely more rye. They're trying okay. to bring out the more rye and try to hit that connoisseur a little bit. So yeah, um, it's a little bit of different uh, outside the traditional uh, Wiser's family, um, but that you would have the big brown coming out the side here on that okay. one. That's why I like these polar histograms. It tells you exactly what you're drinking. They're yeah, clever. It's, cool. it's clever, right? <laughs> um, pot stills. Uh, traditionally, I don't use a lot of pot distillations in the Wiser's family, but I want to just bring it up because I know this group um, should know about it. We always make white dog first. We always make high wines first, and then we will put it into a pot still second. Uh, these are copper stills, and you can see this is a lot 40 still. It is insulated, but it is made of copper. And pot distillation is very simple, actually. You slowly boil it, and the first things that come out, this is the slide that people always like to see, um, mm -hmm. is the very first thing, that's, and all I've done is put along here is the flavors that come from yeast or that come from grain in the fermentation process. Uh, and I've just put it in the order of boiling point. If you actually sat there and did a pot distillation with me on a lab scale, you we actually will pull cuts. And I'm sure you guys have probably done that at Moonshine University maybe. Just pull mm -hmm, the yes. cuts and you can see the green grass notes come out first. Yep. And that's where you make your heads cut. And then you see the fruity notes. You can get cherry and whiny and banana. Uh, pear oil, that's the amyl acetates. A lot of people taught that strawberry. Uh, and then you'll get into the roses once you get close to the finish end. And then the spicy notes from the rye comes close to the end. The one I always like to point out is the tails section. I don't know when you were doing that in Moonshine University, whether you picked up mm -hmm. on it, but the soapy notes that the yeast has made ends up being in the tails. Um, yes. And it makes you wonder how long some people are making pot still whiskeys, whether they're, they're, how long they're letting their tails cut go for. They're doing that on purpose because they want a soapy note to their whiskey. Or are they doing it because it's a cost measure? I'm not sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, moonshine is fine. You you break down. It kind of starts the same. They do it. They do a ten broken up into ten pieces, mm-hmm. sort of the heads, hearts with ethanol in the middle, yeah. and then so they're not getting as deep at the end into exactly all the components. In fact, their finisher is fur for all. Oh, okay. No, it's just yeah, it's just finishing it fur for all. So where yeah. would that fall on this chart? Fur for all is I don't have it on here, and I should. That's you're the first person that's brought that. Oh, there it is. 103. Okay. 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 So they're kind of in, they're in that band that's a little bit higher, although slightly different because they do talk about amyl alcohol, amyl acetate. The amyl alcohol is um, huge with yeast. Probably the most, uh, most prevalent one, actually. Hmm. That or propanol. Propanol is very light, though. Yeah. Propanol actually smells and tastes a lot, a lot like ethanol, actually. Yeah. Well, pro, that's why I always tell if propanol, because that's the one, propanol is the one to me that smells like alcohol. Yeah, like yeah. you can describe it other ways, but it smells like it, like because rubbing alcohol is propyl alcohol, right? Pro, yeah, it's a different. Yeah, pro, it's pro. It's uh, yeah, it's a it's a constructed different. Propanol is different than propyl alcohol, but yes, okay. you're right. They do smell the same. <laughs> okay. Uh, they do smell the same. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm, I've never really gotten this depth. I like you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, a lot of people will end up going to the rose one, the phenols, because uh, four okay. phenol or phenol alcohol is one that yeast will make a lot of. Um, um, where's uh, where's the well? It's for bartenders. Phenols. Not phenols, that I yeah. want to make fun of bartenders, but they, theirs is designed for bartenders, so there's yeah. only so far you can go. Yeah, <laughs> R- roses is a big one that yeast can make, actually. So. Anyway, it, it's food for thought. That's why people like this slide more than anything else. Yeah, it's cool. Um, aging, you've guys been in our aging warehouse. We got 1.6 mm-hmm. million barrels. It's huge. Um, we uh, we don't put electricity in our wa- warehouses at all. Um, we actually have dry fire suppression systems inside of our warehouse. Hmm. So we, and I've gone out and measured uh, some of our brands and barrels in February, and they got down about minus five degrees Celsius. So that's about 20 Fahrenheit. They draw us with a little bit of freezing point of water out there. Um, so it's very interesting. It, it, it's almost like its own organism because the barrels are so jammed together. It actually goes through its own heating and cooling cycle. Um, and if I walked into our warehouse, I walked into about two months ago it was like an air conditioner we're still coming off the winter and the whiskey was still heating up but i do see it get up to about 28 degrees celsius in the summer right about now the barrels will sit about 82 fahrenheit um and inside those warehouses they they lock them up and we don't walk into them our employees have to wear an oxygen monitor and and it takes about an hour to vent it out. And the interesting thing is if you're there in the springtime when we're coming out of the deep thaw, and I know Chicago's the same way as Detroit, all of a sudden you're gonna get a warm spring day because the lakes will start warming up and it's 80 degrees outside, uh, but the whiskey inside the barrel will be like, it'll be 20 degrees. So when the employee's walking in there and they're opening up the door for about an hour, what happens is the warm air rushes in, vents the place out. And what we actually see is pools of water forming on the, on our concrete floor because of the condensation, right? It's that cold beer bottle effect we get. And I get mm-hmm. some of the top chemists walk in our warehouses, Don, why are the hoops on the barrel so rusted? I've never seen that before. And uh, we really, really rely on that. You can see this barrel stave in the bottom right hand. That really helps your barrels expand and contract and breathe. And, and you know about Angel Share, don't have to tell you about that. But for us, we will lose 3% of our volume a year okay. inside the casks. So 1.6 million barrels, we lose 48,000 barrels of volume a year to evaporation. Wow. And in that, and then a couple of things when you're going on, and you're going into a combination of first fill and refilled barrels. Yep. On wine barrels and all rum barrels. We got all kinds of different things. And there, and there, and then just for people, is there a difference in the 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 loss? in the first year versus other years? Or uh, that's a debate. The that's the, a debate for me uh, because the first year we lose 10% uh, and then we lose 3% every year after that. Now, my sense is that the difference between 10 and 3%, Brett, I don't think it's absorption. I actually think it's leaking. Hmm. Barrels for will people, fall apart. Sure, because for people that don't know, that have never seen a barrel, all those barrels that you're looking at in that picture, for folks that have never been to a Cooper, just seen, there is no, the only thing that's holding those barrels together is pressure. 
there are no screws or anything in there. It's just pressure from the wood yep. and the hoops. So, and, and I'm going to talk about barrels and the reactions here in a second, and, and yeah. you'll see why they fall apart. Okay, so for age, this we were going to talk about age, and this is probably the, the one I want to key in on. Tannins. We know there's tannins in, in wood. We, we hear about it. We know about it. And just so the audience know, it's not the same tannins in oak wood as you find in grape skins. Okay. It's hydrosoluble tannins in wood. It's condensed tannins in, 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 uh, in uh, grape skins. Um, tannin is this molecule here. If you really are into chemistry, it's a sugar molecule surrounded by a bunch of phenol molecules. And wood forms it because it's, it's a source of food. It's, that's how it sources food. Okay. You can't taste or you can't smell tannin okay you pick up a glass of whiskey mm, i smell those tannin you, no you can't it's odorless okay but if you get whiskeys that use especially whiskeys that use brand new virgin oak it will give you a tea like taste to it hmm. that's what tannins will do so it's more than appropriate to say it's got a little bit of a black tea note to it that's likely the tannin you're tasting okay interesting we do know we burn barrels so when you burn tannins, it makes these acids at the bottom. You don't have to know. It does make, make acids. Uh, and what ultimately happens is acids are very reactive with oxygen. So as barrels breathe, and this is not going to sell, sell, sound too pleasing, but when an acid reacts with oxygen, it's going to produce hydrogen peroxide. That doesn't sound good, but hydrogen peroxide is such a reactive molecule. Its life inside of a whiskey cask is about a nanosecond. Hmm. because it will react with the alcohol or the ethanol that's already in there. It'll act with acetaldehyde. It'll act with, with acetic acid. And what ultimately happens at the end result is you ultimately produce acetaldehyde and ethyl acetate continuously going on and on and on and on. Okay? So this is our site. The acetaldehyde's on the left, ethyl acetate's on the right. This smells like a green apple. Okay? This is your terroir argument to me. If you're going to say terroir of anything with a distillery, it's probably around aging and the temperature. If you remember back in high school, chemical reactions are all dependent on the temperature. Molecules speed up, reacts even quicker. So we make 10 parts per million of ethyl acetate a year at our facility. If I went to, to Jamaica, he told me uh, when I went down there to visit a, a colleague, they lose 15% to evaporation a year. His ethyl acetate is probably way above mine. But if I go over to Ireland or Scotland, I remember going over to Scappan, talking to the master blender for them. And he said, yeah, Scappan needs to be aged uh, 16 year. He pulled out an eight year. It looked like my two year old spirit. So this is where temperature will force that green apple flavor in your whiskey. Okay. Hmm. Is that kind of clear? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So that this is my curve. And when we talk Weiser's 18 year, I hopefully you got one. This one's 100% corn, guys. This is DD, double distilled, light whiskey, eight. I didn't make this recipe. This recipe has been around for 60 years. <laughs> um, it is corn whiskey, double distilled. This is our base whiskey. If you want to know what how a reaction in a cask tastes like, this is it. This is the taste of angel share. Okay, and you can see the, the curve. There's no rye in this one. It's corn, and you can just, all you're tasting is that green apple flavor, certainly in your whiskey to that. Brett, what are we selling this for currently? This one is $70. Still a steal. For and it always sold. has been. I mean, through the days when, you know, this is one of the few things that has gone up a little bit, you know, 25 years ago, we were probably selling it for 50 but even at 70 bucks, I mean, this is one of the best value for age. Oh, you know, the combination of age and drinkability, one of the best values. To uh, the it, it is very, very, very smooth. I, uh, like I said, you could, this, this is, it hasn't changed in 60 years, this recipe. Um, hopefully it tastes the same like it did 60 years ago. Um, and one thing I'll just say to the group that is listening, um, memorize this taste. Okay, put it in your head. You'll get it in highly aged bourbons, but it gets covered under the grain notes because it's a single distilled product. You'll get mm -hmm. it in the highly aged scotches, but it gets buried under the peat and, and the pot still barley malt. It's there, but this is how you can actually recognize how old a whiskey is, is by that ethyl acetate level in it. 
And this, this is 100% used Canadian whiskey barrels too. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. You're not overwhelmed by new wood, nothing. And I mean, this, this is, this is what it gets. And so that's why I love this as an example of a whiskey. This is what age, this is what the aging process does. It's very graceful for its age. And uh, I would think a big part of that is probably the used cooperage. Honestly, if yeah, this was yeah. a new wood for that long, it'd be dried out. and You, you get know, the tea. Pretty note. rough. Yeah, yeah you, you get that tea note, right? Absolutely. You get that tannin note I, I talked about earlier. Yeah. It's a beautiful sipper. Beautiful yeah, it's beautiful. Sipper. This is one of my favorites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of yeah. my two or three favorite Canadian whiskeys. Yeah, it's it's just just have a nice occasion. And, and for the price point, what would you say? 70, 79, you said? Uh, 69.99. 70 bucks, yeah. 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 I got to go to your store to get it. <laughs> Sell it more here. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, the exchange rate's getting better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as I go into the last part, because we were talking about barrels, I, I figured I'd at least throw this in for this audience. So there's another thing in barrel, we call it wood extracts. Remember I talked about the fiber part of rye? Wood is 100% fiber, okay? Actually, it's 99.5%. The other is oils. So that's the wood lactones. But Yes, it's cellulose, semi-cellulose, and lignin. And I like this slide too, is in the fact that they cut European oak differently than American oak. I don't know if you guys knew that. Yeah. They, yeah, they, they cut quarter of them, right? And they make the stays and they cut European oak on the diagonal to make the stays, mm -hmm. American oak on the 90 degree. I just find that interesting. I thought that was because they had to because the structure of Quercus robur versus yep. yes, that's right. Alpha, right? Yep, okay. yep, yep, you're right. Yep, they they this for evaporation loss. That's why they we've do it. A, we've actually discussed this a lot. We have a very close friend who is a brandy distiller mm, and gets okay. all of his friend gets all of his uh, barrels from uh, limousine and tronque is where he's pulling all the wood from. And he's actually showed us to look at the head, basically look at the end of the stave, and you can tell whether or not it's American cool. oak or. Yeah. European oak just by looking oh, at the nice. tips of the staves. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. Yeah, it, it is interesting that they've they discovered this. You know, it's science. They've discovered this over the years. Mm -hmm. But the thing with barrels, same thing as rye. You want to break it apart, right? In, in a sense, to get flavor. <laughs> I know you don't want to break it apart to get leakies, but you you break it apart to get flavor. And the easiest way to break apart wood is burn it. So when you're burning lignin, this is where you're clove and your leather notes and your that's where vanilla comes from right vanilla mm -hmm. comes from lignin lignin is the world's most unappreciated molecule you can get some <laughs> smoky notes right that's that's breaking apart lignin in a barrel likewise uh when you're breaking apart the cellulose part of it you're, that's where your caramel toffee notes come from and i'll i'll point out too guys it's more than appropriate to say a bubblegum note in whiskey maltol is one of the most prevalent compounds that'll come out of a barrel that's your cotton candy note. And I've sat, I, I secretly go in and creep some uh, Instagrammers when they're doing live. They, oh, this tastes like bubble gum and everything. Yeah, of course it should. That tells you you got a good quality cask. Okay. Interesting. Now, I know you guys probably know the answer because you've heard me speak before, but let's say I want the as much vanilla caramel toffee notes as possible in a barrel. My objective as a blender is to bring in flavor as much as I can. Um, is more fire good or more fire bad? The objective is actually, let's say, to to get as much of this stuff. So you know we can buy, you know, number two barrels, number three, number four, number five barrels, right? Those, that's the depth of burn. Uh, is more fire good or bad if you want? The objective is to get vanilla caramel toffee notes. Well, wouldn't you want a toast level fire? at that point? Yeah, I would say more heat, less fire. I, I would say that too. I never did that in my PhD. I just went to two versus four, but I would say that it would be the case. Um, you can overburn a barrel, right? So along the left-hand axis here is your vanilla caramel toffee notes, right? Oh, okay. Along the bottom is three years of aging in a barrel. And a number two barrel is going to give you more than a number four barrel. Hmm. Okay. So um, why does anyone use number four, I wonder? I mean, it's just I, I'll tell you why. taking more fuel resources to cleans, burn it, right? Cleans up the liquid. Yes. Uh, more said carbon. That? Yes. No I carbon. misled you on this last slide, right? I should have one more arrow and it should be carbon. Just pure yeah. carbon. And why you want pure carbon, let remember I went going back to sulfur. 
in bur- with, especially for bourbon, because bourbon only has one shot at the copper. Mm-hmm. One shot at going through a still to remove any sulfur material. And depends how fast they run their stills or how gunked up their stills may get. Um, they may not eliminate all the sulfur. So the only other way they may get it out is get in a deeper char. They will sacrifice the vanilla caramel toffee notes to absorb any sulfur notes on that black carbon. But can, That's you why develop, you can you develop some of those notes by doing a toast before you char? So theoretically, couldn't you do, do a deeper toast? to release some of that and then do a char for a filter. Yeah, I, I suppose that seems like a lot of work though. <laughs> yeah. There's economics when it comes like to this. It seems like another PhD project for yeah, it. Yeah. It, sounds like a, it sounds like a very fun PhD project. Yeah. And I, I'm going to point out too, a, a lot of these comes out very quick. That's called diffusion. Hmm. Oh, molecules will go to equilibrium really quick. We wouldn't survive as human beings if that did not wasn't the case. So, not, two hundred days, ninety percent of those wood molecules will come into the whiskey. That's a little bit of a mis- misnomer too. But you'll notice in a used bourbon barrel or a multiple use Canadian bur- whiskey barrel, they all kind of rise the same after the two hundred day mark. That's because of this. Alcohol is a good solvent. It actually picks apart the barrel. It'll actually pick apart the the cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. It just, it's almost visualized the game Jenga. You're pulling out the building blocks of the barrel and it comes into your whiskey slowly over time. And that's what you get in the Weiser's 18 year. You'll get the, and I actually don't, I know people rapid age. I think this is the part in the mouthfeel and texture that you'll never get when you're rapid age. The breaking apart of a barrel just purely from ethanol. And I think there are big molecules of lignin and big molecules of cellulose and hemicellulose that we don't even have names of that gives you a mouthfeel and a texture. Hmm. We are also uh, haters of rapid aging. Noted I, haters. I believe yeah, there's a yeah well, I'm, I'm just saying, because there's probably a texture you like in, in aged products. Well, yeah, and it's also the rapid age products also miss the subtractive aging part of it. Yep. I mean, isn't there a yep. bit where you get, you sure. pull some things out, at least at the very beginning that you might not want to stay there in a high amount. And so it all gets sucked out. I and then over agree. time, it starts to get either filtered by passing back and forth through the char label, or it just kind of oxidizes or evaporates out. Or you got to have a hell of a lot of copper contact when you're distilling to try to get a lot no. of the sulfur notes no. out too. I mean, but I just don't think you can mimic the exact way alcohol will chip apart a barrel. Uh, there's big, big, like if you look at the molecule lignin and, and hemicellulose, I think there's big chunks of it that these are molecules that we don't even have names of, to be honest with you, that we feel and taste with a texture in our mouth and we can't even measure. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Uh, here's the diffusion part. So this is the finishing of, of whiskey. Uh, and you guys see this all day long. Um, one, I just want to point out, so we, so we can take a used Canadian whiskey barrel. We can put it in an Oloroso sherry barrel, let's say. And, and the sherry will come out in 200 days, just like the wood I showed you on the previous slide. Um, and you can bring in some interesting notes. One thing I'll get comments on, and I know you guys are smart enough on this, but I, I just want to reinforce it. A lot of times consumers will say, I want your product in an Oloroso sherry cast, but it has to be in an Oloroso sherry cast for years and years and years to get a full flavor of that or appreciation of that Oloroso. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not the case. That's not what you're tasting. The Oloroso will come into your whiskey right away. You're just tasting the evaporation loss. So what happens, you just concentrate up the Oloroso just because of the 3% loss every year. If you want the taste of Oloroso in my whiskey, you'd be better actually to age it 200 days in one Oloroso cask and age it another 200 days in another Oloroso cask, mm-hmm. if that's what you really want. And how much of that is coming from the wood itself and then how much of it is coming from the liquid that was previous contained previously? Well, here's the slide. The so if it, if it was yeah. one used barrel, this is how much the wood extracts come out. You can see the blue mm-hmm. line. And then plus you'd get the Oloroso on top of it, right? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Lots to think about when you blend, isn't it? <laughs> right, yeah. And which combination goes together and which clashes. And I know when we design whiskeys, you want to make sure it's nice and rounded and you're getting a, a flavor profile through the entire tasting experience, right? And that's always the trick as a blender. Mm-hmm. Um, so... 
the 23 year. You, I saw you, you guys got that. Is that what you want to talk about that one too? Yeah, might yeah. as well. Yeah. We've got this one in front of us. Yeah, this one's great. So this one here is interesting. Uh, it's a 23 year old, uh, under made like a little bit like the 15 year, uh, kind of the same proportion as, as a recipe. Uh, but what we wanted to do is make something cash strength. The problem with Canadian whiskey is when you talk cast strength, guys, you got, I know you guys do cast picks all the time. You'll go to a bourbon producer and they distill it one way because they have to by law. They go through their call and still, or maybe they'll go through a double or two, depends which distillery you go to. And that's it, right? Mm -hmm. So they distill it at, I don't know, what is it? 160 proof or whatever the case may be. And they put it in a barrel, la-di-da, <laughs> you know, 10 years later, you got your cast strength whiskey. Same thing with a single malt. They'll, they'll distill it and they'll distill it, triple distill it, double distill it up to 60% alcohol, put it in a cask, uh, la-di-da. What happens when you're a Canadian whiskey producer that distill it, distills it using many different methods? Like we have a range, guys, that our, our light whiskey, our DD, we put away at 76%, which is largely what Weiser's is. But yet we also put a blend in Weiser's, it's our column distilled rye at 58%. So we got two different distillation methods and you put it together in a blend, you don't add water. Is that really a cash strength whiskey? Hmm. Well, I mean, the semantics of it are if you're not adding water and it's the strength that came out of the casts. But we've blended combined it with yeah, different sure. distillates. But it's still, <laughs> so it's, I mean, it's still, water. it's the combined cast strengths if you haven't added water. I mean, that's kind of a semantic. Yeah, and I, I, I Talked about the, with with Dave Broom and Davin. I don't know if you know who those guys, mm -hmm. Davin DeCurmo. Yeah. Davin DeCurmo. And they really yeah. said nobody really does that. Usually <laughs> the cast strength ones are stuck to scotch, right? With the single malts and stuck to bourbon with this one. But who does cast strength blends? Yeah. So that's just why we've named it. You can see it on the front label. This is our cast strength blend. Yeah. Two other people. Yeah. To other people, somebody else does it. I, I'm looking for somebody else who does it. I'm sure there is. There has to be some. I can't yes, be the I first one to think of laser. it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. There's some cast strength blended scotch from Compass Box, I guess. Okay. Uh, so uh, yeah, John uh, is it John? He wouldn't surprise yeah. if he's the one that's done that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, he would be. He will do blends and he bottles of cast strength, and it comes out whatever it comes out after he puts everything together. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm defining it as cast strength blend, not to mislead a consumer here. Mm -hmm. Um. And I, 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 there's no legal term, legal definition. We've just coined the term. And I don't know if it'll stick, guys, uh, but that's what we've done here. So you can see the percentage of column distilled rye that we've put into yeah, it. Yeah, a little higher on this one, right? Yep, yep. And yeah. I, I think the expectation for the 23 year should be, right? Yeah. Um, and we got some bourbon and Canadian whiskey casks. And again, you can see the similar profile with Weiser's. You got the age here mm -hmm. and a little bit of rye uh, kind of thing. And this sits at... I haven't done a tasting on this in a while. I'm actually have to relook at the strength. 60, mm -hmm. what is it at? 64.3 is the one. 64.3, yeah. Yeah. I tasted with this a group in Sweden, and this is going to go to Sweden, actually. Hmm. They were in love with this blend. <laughs> yeah, so how often do you do? Because the one, the first one we had was 61.8. Yeah. 61.8? Yeah. I'm, I'm starting to do it a little bit more and more. And I'm fighting for you guys with our marketing team um, and that uh, I think we should put a little bit more out there. I, I'd be curious how it sells through on your store, to be honest with you, if, if there's a desire from, uh, from your group. And there, most definitely there's. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's do we even have any of this left right now, Brett? Yeah. Uh, I, it, there is because I had we had a couple of people that were trying to hoard it. And so we also had a sharp price. So I kind of it, it, it's floating around in some stores. Okay. So yeah. if you want to come in and talk to somebody in the store, we still have some around. I just pulled it off the web because we literally had somebody from out of state that was trying to, was made an attempt to buy every single bottle in the chain. He was probably Canadian. Probably. Yeah, yeah probably because you can't get it anymore in Canada. Um, but again, like I said, I'm fighting that I'd love, I'd love to get out there, maybe a 24 year old version or 25 year old version or something. Just kind of a little bit of the collectability kind of just different different bonds we call them bonds of whiskey uh, in canada to make these blends but i think this is this is just such a stand-up whiskey to be honest it's yeah. such an awesome whiskey it's uh you know i think arguably probably the most full flavored and full-bodied canadian whiskey i've had yeah and there's a lot going on there seeing that polar histogram right yeah i think it balances nice with the rye we put into it 
Yeah, yeah. and you can tell it's got more eye in it too. It's great. Yeah. Yep. I mean, there. I mean, it's still wiserish, if you want to call it such a word, wiserish. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah. Um, so signature series. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, we might as sure. well preview it a bit. We got a little bit of time here. Okay. So the signature series, uh, we are working with uh, partners like yourselves and others across the U.S. Um, and we did some virtual blending. We were hoping to get you guys to our distillery this year, and obviously COVID did not uh, work out in our favor for it. So we we wanted to make some simplified version because I know you're always asking, can I do cast strength picks, cast strength picks, and, and I'm just reinforcing in Canada, we don't really do cast strength things. We, we do blends. And so we sent you uh, some reasonably priced spirits to make your own blend to suit your own markets. And I know we went into Illinois, uh, Arizona, South, South, uh, South Carolina, South Dakota, a bunch of other states in Minnesota, a bunch of them. And you guys made your own blend. And what we did is we, we gave you two base whiskeys. So we started out with a uh, DD in American bourbon cask and DD in Canadian whiskey cask as some of our bases. And then we, we, we provided you with some single column distilled small grains. So we give you some rye, wheat and barley, basically uh, in American bourbon cask. The barley would happen to be in new oak casks and uh, voila, you come up with, with your own blend. And uh the program started last year and it went very, very well. Um, we had more people get excited about it uh, to make their own signature series design for your own store. Um, and this is what you guys came up with. <laughs> I know you don't have it in front of you. <laughs> wow. Right. It's funny to we see it visualized like here. that. And is that because we had a couple, which one is that? That one. And then you got this one. Oh, okay. very different. So that's the four grain. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah, got it, got it's it. The, the four grain. Uh, so they won't go back to this first one. So you, you certainly wanted to make one a little more uh, rye heavy. Uh, you can see the, and in fact, it's most more rye than anything else uh, than the corn. And looks like uh, Brett, you went out, you put some wheat in it. Did you? I think that's like, if I remember. Yeah. Correctly. Well, it was, yeah. The base <laughs> in the, the flavoring grains were 30, 20 rye to wheat. And then yeah. the base was a 50% base of the American, the double distilled, but American barrel. Yeah. Yeah, and when, when you put in more column stilled whiskey, your fruity notes and your floral notes, you can see them gone up in compared to the Wiser mm -hmm. franchise. And uh, certainly we're not giving you 18 year old or 23 year old whiskey. So you, the, the blue, unfortunately, it's gone down. We wanted to keep the price point somewhat reasonable here. Uh, and we've, these are finished in, in bourbon barrels. The, this, this entire brand is in uh, used bourbon barrels. And that's why the green has gone out as, as much as it has there. Wow. That's cool. It's cool. You don't, you know, for as much whiskey as we taste, we never kind of visualize yeah, what a whiskey it. tastes like with a graphic like this. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's obviously, uh, I didn't put the tasting, I did make some tasting notes myself the other day. I should have put them on here, but these are going to be bigger, bolder whiskeys than the three wisers we had today. I can tell just because of the fruity notes, uh, certainly mm -hmm. coming out here, and it's because of the rye spicy notes as well. Very cool. This one, I, I would actually... This one's probably going to be a big bold. I would imagine uh, my tasting note in this one will be more rounded. You can almost see that. Oh, sorry, Brett. Um, but you can kind of see almost everything's even here. Hmm. It'd be interesting that uh, once you guys come back and review it, uh, the four grain one, uh, which one, I, w whether you'd call this one a bigger, bolder, uh, the more rye one, and the one that's the four grain one is more of a rounded whiskey. Yeah, and that's smallest portion rye too. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. This one. Yeah, I would, well, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Brett. No, it was, I was going to say, and that, that is the one, and I don't know whether we set out to do it, but that was the one where we, we utilized all the components mm -hmm. instead of just reducing down. We, we ended up utilizing all components. Yeah, using both base layers is what was really key on that. I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's going to be a lot of layers to that, that four grain that you got there um, for sure. And, and I, I would anticipate this one will be, Certainly ice cube cocktail enthusiasts seeing the rye level on that one. And this one I could see just sipping neat, probably maybe with an ice, but I could see I could see that one. That's kind of what my approach would be with it. Kind of cool when you see visual, it isn't it? <laughs> it's really cool. Yeah. So where and where are we with these in the the actual manufacturing process, so to speak? Um, i the formulas and everything I've submitted to our team uh we i know we got approvals and sign-offs 
I would think this fall we'll probably start doing the blends. Uh, and as to when they show up, I got a default to Gina. She's still on the line here. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I just posted the tasting notes in the chat for both blends. Um, but I think we're bottling as far as I know in January. So hopefully we should be on shelves at Benny's around springtime of next year. Yep. And that's what, that, that's what we had, that's what we talked about. And Don, you said that there was a finishing period. So when this gets blended, this is going to get put together. It's not just going to get blended and then bottled, right? Blended, put in a tank. No, I'll, I'll finish the then... grain. I'll even finish the grain separately too, Brett, though. I don't okay. finish the blend. Oh, I finish good. each individual component actually. Okay. Got it. Yeah. It's easier for us to handle and our equipment to do it that way than bring it in a blend right. tank and then put it back into the barrels. Just right. more manageable that way. I, trust me, they don't taste any different if you do it one way or another. Yeah. Technically, yeah, the no, same we'll... components will still come out. Right. Yeah. No, it's great. This is it. This is exciting. We were able to work with you on the first lot 40 barrel strength. Oh, yeah. Um, a little bit good. with Ryan, with our friend Ryan Maloney from uh, Julio's in yeah, Westboro. I got, I got one of them one behind me here. One yeah. of them behind me. Yeah. The, uh, the blend you did with the first time we saw a lot 40 cash strength in the U S yep. was uh, blended yeah. with you guys and uh, Ryan. What a great little project. That was, that's my favorite out of the three, actually that we've yeah. launched, launched as cash strength. Uh, we are, re I, I'm going to tease. I don't know if you get Canadians yeah. watching this. We are t uh, releasing a cash strength lot 40 in a peated quarter cask. Wow. Ooh. Oh, it's tasty. Hey, Gina, don't forget your friends in uh, Lincoln Park when you <laughs> remember get a Gina, of that. You remember, Gina, you can go back and forth across the border, so you could <laughs> potentially go. <laughs> I'm working on getting myself a bottle. And I, I, bring it I'm over hoping there there's US. I think there's US allocation, but I can't, pro I, I don't know for sure. We just want a That's weed taste. Question. That's all we want. Please. That's right. Yeah. Just stop it duty free and clean them out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Canada keeps the good stuff to themselves. Yeah. No, um, yeah. It, it's, it's an interesting dynamic when you get the smoky and spicy rye together. Um, it really plays an interesting dynamic. And I know I've done some little bit of the peated in Oloroso with the rye as well. It's, it's an interesting combination when you start bringing those things together. It's just a whole different complexity and layer uh, that you, you get to. It makes my polar histograms look a little funny. <laughs> when you start doing peated, right. but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Was there any questions that anybody has or you guys kind of followed along? I don't know. I think we got, uh, we asked most of the questions I had, I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, good. we covered, which is, it's a, it's a, it's a good format to cover everything with. And this is, this has been the, the only other person that we've spoken to where we have gotten this deep and had this much fun. It's probably Richard Seal. Oh, okay. um, we had a great discussion with Richard Seal about rum. Yeah. And oh, I think rum is a category that's a little bit under service a little bit. I think there you can do some real interesting flavor. I know you guys probably know about Dunder and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. I, 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 I think there's some real interesting things you can do there to get some real interesting esters coming out in, inside of the, those rums. Yeah, American consumers just don't. And we're working on it. American consumers, yeah. there is a very dedicated small group of people that are interested unfortunately larger market is still not quite there you probably you know famously in northeastern canada have a more yes. developed yes, nerdy, you know yeah. get, with the newfies and, and, oh, and nova yeah. scotia in that area they love a brand called lambs rum i'm actually i don't have a bottle behind me but i'm responsible for a brand called lambs that is just on fire in newfoundland the right. half the liquor store Screech, is lambs right? And What's that? Screech is the other, and Screech is Real the other Screech, big one. Yeah, but yeah. Lamb's Rum is a very traditional, like, because it comes from the British Navy. And if you actually look at the bottle of Lamb's, I'm sorry, I'm going down rabbit holes. I apologize, sure. Gina. But Lamb's Rum is, uh, it's a bottle in a hexagon. Huh. It's a I, hexagon shaped bottle because they designed it for the Navy way back in the day. So they don't, they don't roll, roll around, roll around on the ships and they can stack yeah. them. Huh. 
Yeah. It's, so they, they've maintained that as a brand and they, and it's, it's, it's growing in the UK again, the lambs and the traditional rum. You're starting to see some nuances of rum coming back in pockets like Eastern Canada and, and the UK and well, may, maybe in the US at some point. But Gene, I add that to our order for when you go to Canada, okay? Yeah. Lambs, <laughs> yeah. lambs it's, it's, it's a nice, nice rum. I really enjoy, enjoy that. Cool. Kind of like if I remember right, it's like blackstrap style almost. We do it? have a Navy a version. We yeah. have a Navy okay. overproof yeah. version as well. Wow. Uh, which it sits at 75% ABV. And that's a little bit, a little bit toasty and warming, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Like There's this Wiser's 23. Version. Yeah. Well, even more at 75% than the challenge with, with wow. those, well, those ones at 75%, it becomes a whole new issue with uh, filtration and stuff. Some funny things kind of start happening at 75%. <laughs> a whole other topic. <laughs> more for ways than day. Wrong. Sure. <laughs> Well, Don, thanks a lot for your time today. We really appreciate it. Uh, I like seeing me. tasty notes. Uh, pretty cool like that. Gina, and thank you. And thanks for those thanks. awesome tasting notes on our upcoming blend. I stole them and we'll be using them in a marketing email. Big thanks. Big oh, thanks. no, no well, problem. I can email them to you. <laughs> yeah, Gina has all that information. Like you. She can email them to you for sure. For sure. All right, well, uh, Dr. Don, thank you again. Thank you, Gina. Thanks, everybody who listened. Uh, we'll be back next Wednesday, actually, with Freddie No, who is some multiple uh generation beam i think fifth or sixth or eighth or something I think I he's a little bit deeper than that he's more yeah. like seven or eight but uh we're gonna be talking about the new basil hayden toast uh which should be pretty cool so don thank you again gina thank you cheers everybody else thanks guys cheers. Cheers. cheers all right thanks guys i'm finishing this cheers <laughs>